Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for bringing us together. And Father, as we um, honor the dads in this room this morning and those listening online, Father, we just thank you that you are the perfect example of love, perfect example of what a father should be consistent and always there with unconditional love. We pray you'll be with our pastor this morning as he delivers the message you've laid on his heart. We pray that we will respond in a way that pleases you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. I want to introduce to you uh, a listening guide for your children in grades one through five. I've got a little little um, uh, challenge, I guess, as an incentive. Uh, since we can't open up kids' church right now and, and all those things, and it's, uh, we're not at that point yet. Um, so it's a listening guide, okay? And here's simple. If you're watching online or you're here in the service today, there's a little sheet in the back like this, and uh, it's got Proverbs on the front of it. And so here's what I'm going to encourage your kids to do to help them kind of engage in the, the sermon today is I want the kids to listen. This will be different every week, okay? I want the kids to listen to how many times I say the word wisdom or wise in this sermon today, okay? So what you can do is just take a little tick mark, you know, like you're Mark down, you know, and how many times I say wise or wisdom. You don't have to separate the two, just wise or wisdom, and, and you make a tick mark and see how many times I say that word, those words, in this sermon. When we leave today, you put your answer at the bottom, and you write your name and put it in the lobby back there. And those listening online can do the same thing. Uh, all you have to do is do the same thing and then have your mom and dad text me uh, that answer within 10 minutes after the service is over. Because if I don't do it in 10 minutes, you get to go back and listen to the sermon again. And uh, it wouldn't be fair. So within 10 minutes, well, they can do that. They, they can't do they can't do it in 10 minutes. So, but anyway, within 10 minutes, do it within 10 minutes uh, and, uh, and send that answer in to me and let me know who it is. And uh, the winner, uh, with the closest number, are the correct number next week, we'll get a prize and we'll do it every week. It's just a way to engage your children in the sermon. So um, excited about that opportunity, okay? So um, you can get ready. A few years ago, the LA Times published an article that in theory said this, that the Bible is outdated and needed to be changed. In reality... I can tell you that's a common thought in our society today. They would say that the Bible is outdated and no longer relevant for today. But I came across some scripture in, uh, in Ephesians that I want to read to you that I would argue that more than any time in my life, these words to the Ephesians church speak with much power and much needed instructions. So I want you to turn to Ephesians 5. I want you to look at this text, and then we're going to go to Proverbs in just a moment. But in Proverbs chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15 to verse 17, look what it says. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I'm telling you, these words could not be more relevant to us than today, living in the 21st century. The days were evil in Paul's day to the, to the church in Ephesus. And the days are even more evil today. It's almost a cookie-cutter, um, really, um, reflection of our culture, the in, in Ephesus and in today. In Ephesus, they were wealthy, very wealthy. One of the wealthiest 
um, cities around. The United States is one of the wealthiest countries around, if not the wealthiest countries around. But Ephesus was experiencing some, some loose morality. And the United States of America is doing the exact same thing, loose morality. Charles Stanley, writing about the Ephesians church, said this, As you can imagine, it was difficult for the believers in Ephesus to maintain high standards. Their hostile environment made it that much more important for them to be asking, what is the wise thing to do? I want you to think about that question in regards to our life. What is the wise thing to do? You can think about the pandemic that we have been going through and continue to go through and the decisions that you've had to make during this pandemic. As a pastor, I never ever thought that I would ever have to lead a church through a time of a, a national pandemic. There have been some very difficult decisions that have been laid upon me and put upon me to, to make some wise decisions. And, and I had to ask that question, what is the wise thing to do? Not what Monty wants to do, but what is the wise thing to do? So you got the pandemic, you got the racial unrest, you got politics, you got life's decisions. Whatever it is, many of us must wrestle with that question, what is the wise thing to do? And so it's imperative today, today that we need to have this extraordinary wisdom for ordinary life. And so today we're launching a new series called Just That, Extraordinary Wisdom for Ordinary Life from the book of Proverbs. And I will tell you honestly that Proverbs, since becoming a follower of Jesus Christ and growing in my relationship with Christ, I would have to tell you that Proverbs has been the book in the Bible that has regularly impacted my life daily than anything else. I mean, there's a lot written up in my Bible in a lot of places. But if you scroll through the book of Proverbs, in my Bible, there's so much writing in the book of Proverbs. And so this book has absolutely impacted my life on a day-to-day -day basis. And so Proverbs speaks exactly where we are living today. So I want to read to us the first seven chapters, the first seven verses of chapter one, okay? And then we're going to kind of unpack these verses. We're going to go through and journey through not every chapter of the book of Proverbs, but as we go through and as I encourage you to read a proverb a day, we're going to look at some proverbs in Scripture in regards to how it applies to our life. Proverbs chapter one, beginning in verse number one. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair. And if that right there doesn't speak to today, righteousness, justice, and equity. Doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of, the, of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So I want to ask this question and unpack this question is this. Why Proverbs? Why Proverbs? And so here's what I want to give you a statement that I'm going to unpack in three parts today. And this is the reason why Proverbs. Here it is. Proverbs provides wisdom. Proverbs provides wisdom for every area of our life at every stage of life. Proverbs provides wisdom for every area of life at every stage of life. 
So let's look at the first part. Proverbs provides wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, you'll find the word wise or wisdom mentioned just over 125 times. It does so in order to help us acquire God's wisdom to the decisions and activities of everyday life. So, Pastor, what is wisdom? Here it is. Here's the simple definition. It's the ability to see life from God's perspective. The ability to see life from God's perspective. So as I apply wisdom to my life, I begin to make decisions and live out my life in response to seeing it from God's perspective. Warren Wiersbe, a great theologian that I like to quote many, many times, a lot. He said this, wise men and women have the competence to grasp the meaning of a situation and understand what to do and how to do it in the right way at the right time. How is that possible? How is it possible? Because the wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. Notice the how it starts. It says how Solomon, who is writing this to his son, a father to his son, he starts, he says, we, we are growing to, to know wisdom. That's, he, he opens this book by saying, I'm writing this so that you can obtain. That word obtain is to know, so, or to attain wisdom, to know wisdom. Now, the primary usage of this word is, is to know relationally or experientially, meaning this, a passionate pursuit of wisdom in Proverbs is really a pursuit of the character of God himself. So when you and I pursue wisdom, What we're literally doing is pursuing the character of God himself. It is you and I displaying the character of God through various expressions of daily living. That's what wisdom is. In reality, I ask this question. Can a non-Christian read Proverbs and be applicable to a non-Christian? The answer is absolutely yes. A Christian or even a non-Christian can can read the book of Proverbs and and be applicable to their life. But there's a lot from the book of Proverbs that anyone can benefit from. But ultimately, Proverbs will benefit you the most out of a love relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. God ultimately designed Proverbs to be enjoyed in the context of a love relationship with Him. So if you have a love relationship with the Father, listen, you can really enjoy, you can really benefit more than somebody who isn't because this is a love letter written to us from God Himself. The very wisdom of God wrapped up in His love letter to us because He wants the best of our life. All right? So Proverbs provides wisdom. But here's the second thing. Proverbs provides wisdom for every area of life. The book of Proverbs really deals with every conceivable area of life that you can think of. That's why you say, well, does the Bible really speak about this? Does it really talk about this? I mean, there's some things the Bible really doesn't talk about. But I'm here to tell you, Proverbs really does, it it really deals with every conceivable area of life that you can think of. So I'm going to give you some samples of what I'm talking about. Uh, You know, when you, I I love breakfast. Breakfast is one of my favorite uh, meals. If I take time to really cook a good breakfast with eggs, bacon, ham, hash browns, more bacon. I I mean, I I would load up, you know. So, you know, so, so why I love why I love to go to like Cracker Barrel or Denny's. I'm making some of y'all hungry right now, huh? Uh, why I go to like to well, I like to go to those places is because they have the the sampler. So the sampler you can get a little bit of everything, right? You don't have to get specific. You know, I, I want this. Why well, you can't have? But a sampler you get a little bit of everything. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of sampler of 
dealing with how Proverbs deals with different areas of our life, okay? Here's simple number one. It deals with wisdom for my walk with God. With my walk with God. Proverbs gives me wisdom about giving the word of God priority in my life. Verses 2 through 5 and verse 7 of this first section in Proverbs really begin very similarly. If you go and read it, you'll see the words, I mean, very, very, they're very similar in the very first words of the, of the sentences in each of those verses. They'll use the words such as commandments, or you'll see principles, or you'll see the word instructions. All of those are referring to the Word of God in the book of Proverbs. So for six chapters in a row, we're, we're instructed that wisdom gives priority to the Word of God. Why does it do that? Look at Proverbs chapter 7. Turn to Proverbs chapter 7 and look at verse number 2. Why does it do that? Why does this give, why does wisdom give priority to the word of God? Verse number 2 of, of Proverbs 7. It says this, keep my commands and you will live. That word live means simply this. It means to enjoy life. See, many people believe that if, if you really give priority to the Word of God, it's going to rob you of the joys of life. But the wisdom of Proverbs gives us the exact opposite. It, it is the giving priority to God's Word. It's giving value to what God's Word says that I find the ability to enjoy life as God intended it to be lived out in my life. You know what I've discovered lately, and, and it seemed to be more more uh, dominating now than never before. There's a lot of noise right now in our society, isn't there? A lot of noise. You got noise from the news. You got noise from social media. You got noise from politicians. You got noise from celebrities. You even got noise from even some pastors. And here's what I'm telling you, Proverbs says. We need a steady dose of God's Word to enable us to get the most out of our lives. Listen, it's not the church just saying, this is what you need, this is what you need to read, this is what you need to take up to be a good Christian. No, wisdom demands that I give priority to the Word so that my mind and my life is not so consumed by the noise of the world, to drown out the noise of the world so that I am rooted and that I am grounded in the Word of God, a book that is a love letter written to me for the one who loves me most. Let me give you another example. Not only wisdom for my walk with God, but wisdom for my relationships. It, it speaks about relationships in the home. It speaks about relationships in your marriage, to your children, as a child, to your children, parenting, at work, as an employer, as an employee, as a coworker, relationships inside the church. Let me give you a specific example of that. What I'm talking about, of, uh, in regards to relationships inside the church, it's the principle of accountability. Look at Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Now, you've probably heard this, you've heard this statement before, and you've heard, probably heard this verse before, but it's so vital to us as followers of Jesus Christ. Proverbs 27, 17. And it says this, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. It's a picture of taking... Uh, you know, the, the tool of the ancient day, a piece of iron, and just hammering it against each other, rubbing it against each other to sharpen it, to make it more useful for the task that it's called to do. Proverbs teaches me that just like iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. God uses the community of the church, the coming together as brothers and sisters of Christ, to sharpen us, to shape us, to rub against each other. 
Proverbs teaches us that it, it, that is wisdom of, of inviting others into our lives to become the person that God intends for me to be. You're not to live your life on an island. You're not to live the Christian life all by yourself. It's in community with other believers. It's coming together as a body of Christ and listening and inputting and, and being challenged in your faith to see what you believe. And, and so we need each other to, to rub against each other because iron sharpens iron. And we need accountability. And what the problem sometimes in the church is there's no accountability within the church. With brothers and sisters living their life, all they want, how they want to live their life, and there's no accountability whatsoever. It's wise in your relationships within the body of Christ, the principle of accountability. And we'll talk more about this area as we go through this. Here's sample number three, wisdom for my decision making. L let me ask you a question. Do you have to make any decisions this week? <laughs> I mean, there's probably thinking right now, by Tuesday or Wednesday, there's some major decision that I have to make this week. Every day you have to make a decision, right? Whether it's, whether it's a small decision or a major decision. But what, there's a, maybe a major decision that we have to, to, to make this week. If we're all honest, decision making is just a part of everyday life, right? And Proverbs teaches us that wisdom should be a part of that decision making. You need to invite wisdom into that decision-making process. Look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. All right? Listen to what Solomon says. The way of the fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. When facing a decision, wisdom always seeks counsel from other people. One of the principles in my life is, is in some major decisions as a pastor that I have had to make I, is that I knew that I had to seek wisdom in seeking counsel from others. I have said this so many times. I said don't live life on an island, but I also say this, do not ever make decisions on an island. Where does that principle come from? Right there in Scripture. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. And one of the things it teaches us in making right decisions is to be sure we're getting counsel, listen to me very carefully, not just from anybody, Okay? Not just from anybody, but from godly people. Seeking, seeking to push you, seeking to push me, seeking to direct me in, in pursuing the will of God for my life and your life. So when you seek counsel, you seek counsel from godly people. I can't tell you how many times I've used this single principle in my life. And by adhering to this principle, I want to tell you this, and for me in my life, by seeking counsel, wise counsel from godly people, by doing that, it's, protect, it's, it's, it's done three things. It's either protected me, it's redirected me, or it's changed me. And I promise you this, if you will seek godly counsel in making decisions in your life, that you don't make decisions on an island. It, it, listen, it will, it, it, it will protect you. It will redirect you. Or it will change you. And here's what I learned in decision making. I've said this before in, in a previous message. And I don't know what sermon it was in. But here's, here's, here's what I've learned. That my input is never enough. What I mean by that is I don't know it all. I don't know it all. So my input is never enough. I don't know it all. My perspective is always limited. What's that mean? I can't see it all. 
And then this, my flesh is always deceitful. And for those three reasons, I always need to seek counsel from others. In Proverbs over and over and over and over and over again drills this principle into our lives. You're not being weak by seeking godly counsel. You hear me? You're seeing strength in you by seeking godly counsel. Here's sample number four. Wisdom for my words. Go to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs 17 and verse number 9. Listen to what it says. He who covers over an offense promotes love. But whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Pastor, what, that, what does that mean? Well, here's what that means. When, when someone does something wrong to you, and it wrongs you, then wisdom says this, that you go to that person, that you make it right, and that stays between you and the other person. The last part of that passage says, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Let me tell you two ways, two damaging ways that we do that in the body of Christ. Number one, prayer request. (laughs) Prayer request. Sometimes we'll say, um, I don't want to gossip, but but we need to pray for them. Let me tell you what happened. And so instead of just maybe saying a name or just lifting up a family or whatever, sometimes we give details. So we've got to be careful about prayer requests in the body of Christ. But number two, social media. Social, listen to me very carefully. Social media is not the place to reconcile with your brother and sister in Christ, period. Period. If, if, if I take the wrong in someone else's life and I broadcast that on social media without walking through this process of restoration and reconciliation, the Bible says I'm separating close friends. So wisdom chooses words carefully. There's wisdom in Proverbs about our words and how we use them. Very, very important. So that's another sample. Here's sample number five, the last sample. Wisdom for my life in the world. You understand this. We as followers of Jesus Christ, we are citizens of another kingdom. Y'all get that? Y'all know that, right? This isn't our home. When God's, we just passing through, right? But as we live here, I want you to understand that we are ambassadors for that kingdom. We are citizens of another kingdom, but while we are here for a a, a amount of time in this life, we are simply ambassadors for that kingdom. So here's what that means. We are to represent the world that we long for right here. We are to represent the kingdom principles right here. And Proverbs gives us so much wisdom to do this. All right? See if this doesn't sound current. We'll talk about the Bible's outdated, it needs to be changed in that L.A. article and what our, our, our contemporary culture says. Proverbs 17, verse 15, look what it says. Same chapter we just looked at, but skip down to verse 15. Acquitting the guilty and condemning the innocent, the Lord detests them both. Does that sound right where we are? That's wisdom we need today. So let me make that verse very practical. In the recent events that we've just seen, it is biblically wise for us to demand justice for someone like George Floyd. 
It's the biblically wise thing to do. Because we're living out kingdom principles in this place. But at the same time, it is also biblically wise to support those who are brothers and sisters in Christ, in law enforcement, who are making a difference in the system by laying down their lives and putting their lives on the line every single day. Politically, those things may be mutually exclusive, but biblically, they are the wise thing to do. So wisdom gives us practical ways to live in this world that we are experiencing right now. So Proverbs provides wisdom for every area of life. And I just gave you a small sample. And we'll unpack some of these and more as we walk through this. But here's the last thing. So Proverbs provides wisdom for every area of life. But it also provides wisdom at every stage of life. Solomon addresses that wisdom is for three groups of people. He talks about the naive and the youth at the very beginning. Pastor, what is that? What's the naive? Well, the naive is they're, they're young by experience. They don't, haven't gone through reality of experiencing life. They're young. They don't know better because they haven't experienced it. That's, the, that's what he's talking about, naive. That's what he's talking about. He also talks about being young. This wisdom is for the young. That, that simply is this. They're young and experienced. Not only experienced, maybe they've, they've gone maybe through the experience, but they're young in age. Proverbs promises these things in Scripture. If you go back to that passage, it promises prudence, it promises knowledge, and it promises discretion. And all three of those words really mean the same thing. What does that mean, Pastor? Here's simply what that means. It's the ability to use good judgment and to carefully consider the consequences and act accordingly. The Proverbs is not just for the naive. The ones who are young by experience. It's not just for the ones who are, are young because of their age. But it also speaks of another group. Look at, um, go back to verse 1. And look at, I mean, chapter 1, look at verse 5. Here's a third group. The wise. Proverbs 1, verse 5 says this, Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. It's for the one who is experienced. It's for the ones who are older. It's for the ones who have been walking with Jesus for a very long time. Listen to me. Until we breathe our last breath, we are continuing learners, right? We never obtained anything. We may have matured in a lot of areas. But, and listen to me, if we ever stop learning, then we're done. We're done. So continue to learn. Proverbs provides wisdom for every area of life, but for every season of life. It doesn't matter where you are in your walk with Jesus. Proverbs provides wisdom for you. That's why we are going to study this amazing book. But in closing, I just want to ask this question. Where do I begin? This is very short. Why Proverbs? But where do I begin? Well, let me tell you where it starts. It starts with an attitude. An attitude. Look, Solomon says this. In the last verse there, in chapter 1, verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, fear doesn't mean being afraid. It doesn't mean a scare. It's just scared of God. No, it means a, a reverence or an awe of God. It, it's the idea of not wanting to hurt God in any type of way. 
It, it is this desire to, to please him. So it begins with a heart decision. It begins with a heart attitude saying, God, I need wisdom that I don't have it all figured out. It doesn't matter if I'm naive. It doesn't matter if I'm young. It doesn't matter if I'm wise. But listen to me, God, I, have it, I don't have it all figured out, and I think I know what to do. But I'm not sure. And I may be totally off, God. I need your perspective on this situation. Your perspective about my life in different areas of my life. So listen, it requires an attitude. It starts with an attitude. But then it also requires action. So I want to challenge you to do three things. I want you to devote from this day forward as we walk through this. I want you to devote time daily to be alone with God in the book of Proverbs. Okay? That's number one. Second of all, I want you to weekly join us in person or online Spend some time, and then not only that, as we walk through this and journey through this progress together, then spend some time with a spouse or a friend, somebody, discussing uh, some wisdom that you're getting from Proverbs. T take one verse and just start unpacking that. I mean, I'm struggling with this, okay? Here's how you do it. God's so unique in this, right? Proverbs has 31 chapters in it. 31 chapters, in most months, it has 31 days. So you take a chapter that corresponds with the day of the week. So today is the 21st. So you'd go and you'd read the 21st chapter of the book of Proverbs. Tomorrow's the 22nd. Read the 22nd chapter of the book of Proverbs. And just, I, I challenge you, to read a proverb a day. And I've said this many, many times. Proverbs is the mind of God. Psalms is the heart of God. I like to read a psalms. I go through psalms, several psalms a day. Then I take a proverb a day. I want to get the mind of God in me. And I want to get the heart of God in me. And I can read other things too and I do that. But I want to encourage you that you join us weekly in, in person or online and then get with somebody to talk about one of these Proverbs. And then the last thing, monthly embrace a new rhythm of reading through the Proverbs. And I want you to not just, I know we're kind of in the middle of, of, of the month here, but after we're through with this in a couple of months, I want to challenge you to do this for the next 12 months and build this discipline in your life and then see what God does in your life. You need wisdom? I do. I, I absolutely do. Not just any wisdom. I need God's wisdom in my life. Don't live your life apart. Don't make any decision in your life apart from seeking God. Listen to me. You know what we do? We ask God to help us in the big decisions of life, don't we? And we leave him out in the small decisions. I got this, God. I got this. Really? I got this. Really? No. No. You need him. I need him. Let's pray. So where you find yourself today, I said earlier in this text, this message that the book of Proverbs can be some used for believers and non-believers. If you're a Christian, man, you can get some some important uh, truth out of the book of Proverbs, important wisdom. You can do the same thing as 
somebody who is not a believer. You never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And you can glean some things from there applicable to your life. But to get the most out of this book is having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor, how do you do that? You simply understand this, that God loved you so much. Because of your sin, what that sin is, it separated you from a, a, a relationship with God. God created us out of his love, and he created us for a relationship, an, an incredible relationship. But because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God, man's rebellion against God, we, it separated our relationship. It severed that relationship. And that was broken. And so God had a plan to reconcile man to himself. And that was to the person of Jesus Christ. That's why you have Christmas. That's why the manger. That's why Jesus came. He didn't come just to live life. He came to die. To give his life as a ransom. To pay the penalty of your sin. That separates you from God. That would order, in order for Jesus to come, he, he came and he died upon the cross. Shed his blood. Was buried in a tomb. And was raised on the third day as a testimony that God accepted his sacrifice on the cross. What I had to do, Pastor, is believing in that Jesus. It's putting your faith and trust in that Jesus that died on the cross, was buried in a tomb, and rose on the third day. It's not religion that will save you. It's not coming to church that will save you. It's not reading a proverb every single day that will save you. It's not being a good person that will save you. It's a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that will save you. You want to start out being wise? Young man, young woman, you want to start out being wise, dad, on Father's Day? You want to start out being wise, mom, on this, on this Father's Day? Do you want to start out being wise on the, on the 21st of June today? If you don't know Jesus, the greatest wisdom that you could get is understand that God is pursuing you out of his love. And the most important decisions you can ever make, the most wisest decision you can ever make is giving your life to Jesus Christ. What's what keeping you from doing that? It's pride. Do you think you have to get your life together in order to, to come to Christ? No. You come to Christ just as you are, and Christ makes you clean. What's stopping you today? If you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, here's all you got to do. I'm going to pray a prayer. The prayer doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. And here's what you got to do. Just say this prayer. Mean it in your heart. And just pray this prayer. God's listening. God's ear is still tuned to your voice. And to see, he sees you right where you are. In your home, at your work, in this place. Pray this prayer. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I can't save myself. I, I know that being good doesn't save me. I know that coming to church doesn't save me. I, I know that just reading the Bible doesn't save me. I know one thing that saves me. And it's a person. And his name is Jesus. And it's that Jesus that I've asked in my life today. I ask that Jesus to be just my Savior today to save me from my sin to help me reconcile to my, my Heavenly Father I ask that Jesus to come into my life I believe He died on the cross that He went to a tomb and was, and was raised on the third day and I want that Jesus to come and reside in my life and not only to be my Savior to be, but be the Lord of my life He's owner of my life He's owner of my life. He's owner of my family. He's owner of my job. He's owner of my car. He's owner of my money. He's owner of every area of my life as I give my life to him because I know that's the wisest decision I will ever make in this life. And so, dear Jesus, I give you my life. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. I repent of the things I used to do. I don't want to do those things anymore. And I turn to you 
And I follow you all the days of my life, the best I know how. And when I mess up, and when I fail, and I'm going to, all I know is this, that I can come to you because of what you did on the cross, and I can ask for forgiveness of my failure to you. And you will forgive me because the Bible says, not that preacher, the Bible says that you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness if I confess to you my sins. And I believe that because that's your word. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen.